Hi, this is David Kechner, and you're listening to The David Creek Show. Yahoozy! This is The Dave and Creech Show, the only podcast where podcaster C.J. Creech and actor Dave Sheridan come together to talk all things entertainment with your favorite entertainers. Want to ask our guests a question? Tweet them to at Dave Sheridan or at CJCNOV88, and they may be asked to our guests live on the show. We do have to ask you stay seated during the podcast because this ride may get a little bit hilarious. Now here's your hosts, Dave and Creech. Hey guys, welcome to the Dave and Creed Show. This is episode 39, and we have quite a treat for you. As usual, I am Creech, he is Dave, and we've got a pretty phenomenal guest on the show today. Phenomenal. Phenomenal. That's like That sounds like a Donald Trump word. It, we have uh, a Donald Trump it may. I mean, I know he's, he's, got the, he's got the market on huge so no that's no that's bernie sanders is is huge he's terrific um phenomenal is probably i think amazing i think he's really terrific is the one donald trump uses a lot it's going to be terrific like when he's going to replace i'm going to op- uh what is it repeal and replace obamacare uh with what exactly something terrific you know what I mean? Yeah. It's just going to be terrific. Well, are there any details? It's going to be awesome. Yeah. Kind of and... like a, he's sort of like that, uh, like just like a frat guy. That's the guy guarding the keg. He bought the keg. He owns the tap. Can't have a party without the tap. And then, you know, it's just like, um, it's just, you know, you come into the party, it's going to be awesome. It's going to be terrific. the best meals you know he probably has the best meals the best cook the best chef the everything you know oh yeah Always. which is great i love his positivity that you know life can be let's put it this way and you know obviously the guy's had a lot of he's he's a businessman in the maneuvering of <laughs> of um junk bonds in a sense of his businesses you know what i mean they're shells or their bankruptcies but he maneuvers it around and you know and he has God knows what kind of money he's, uh, what what he's really sitting on in terms of his real worth versus his, you know, banknote worth of loans and where his names are just licensed out, et cetera, et cetera. But, you know, and this just goes out to everyone, everyone that's listening out there, positive thinking will get you much further than negative thinking and doubt. So... That's the, the one attribute that I can give Donald Trump an A plus on is I really believe that he believes his, you know, big, his glory. You know what I mean? I really, you know, when he said like, I alone am the one that can fix this, you know, it's a, you know, it's a, it's a obviously a, a ridiculous statement. But I actually think he believes that you do have to, you know, you got to put one foot in front of the other. You got to, you know, there's all those movies. And you just got to believe. Um, so, I believe in yourself. He certainly believes. He drinks his own Kool Aid, and it's and it's Trump Kool Aid. Trump Aid, terrific. Trump Aid, it's the best. He, he drinks his he drinks his own Kool Aid, but it's the best Kool Aid. <laughs> It's it's gonna be terrific. We're gonna make a bunch of money off of this Trump aid, and it's yeah. gonna be the only drink you can drink in America. It's just yeah, gonna. It is. But I mean, you know what? I'm, you have to have that mentality. You look at like anyone that wins the sports championships or the boxer guys, and the, you know, and everyone's like, I oh, be so egotistical, or this thing, or the a rock star. It it it's not like the ego. And the big headedness came from success. Certainly, success continues to fuel it. That's just putting logs on the fire. But 
the beginning of even that journey to success starts with unbridled egoness, um, you know, probably verging on sociopathic, narcissistic. You know, you know. I mean, narcissism is a, uh, you know, definitely. You look at these top top people in the world, and they're, you know, I, I, you're, and we're always like, why are these leaders like that, or why? Are, why are these people like this, the ones who are in position of power and success? Because narcissistic, sociopathic people, that is their trait. You know what I mean? It's sort of like they will, they are not the cream that rises to the top. They are the totalitarian, uh, egotistical people that, you know, step on a lot, you know, ladders have treads and they are made of hands and fingers and knuckles that get stepped on all the way up. And, um, so that is not going to change until the end of time. Well, hopefully we get put in position where we get good television out of it, good ratings, good hairdos, you know, colorful suits, but we might, you know, mustaches. Yeah, I, I, it, it know, seems like it's it's it, it was forever ago I that we've been do, talking about this media circus, and now it's, well, I would say it's going to end next Tuesday on Election Day, but mm-hmm. obviously we're in for four more years of whatever chaos. In the you fallout need to see Wag the, Have you seen Wag the Dog, that David Mamet movie? Uh, I haven't. Oh, my goodness. Preach, you young fella. It's actually <laughs> a pretty good movie. It's not like, it's not amazing in any way. And it's, and it's you know, there's other uh, news media um, movies. What's that one where the guy yells out the window? I'm, I'm you got to be more specific. tired of it's like he's like an anchor man, and he yells out the window, I'm sick and tired of this shit, I'm not going to take it anymore. And then everyone starts yelling it out the window in New York. I, I forget. Keckner, if he was on at this time, would know what it's called. Especially since he's starring in Anchorman 3. He's right. out this May. Um, but uh, basically, you know, I look with, on the Hillary side, one of the spins with... Trump, as he was kind of spiraling down and sort of right at the ship a little bit here at the end, making a little bit of a ninth inning rally, we'll see what happens. Um, there'll be a rain delay, because that's when, this is just like the World Series. Right? You know, yeah, Cleveland yeah, now that you're, you're bringing it up. Game yeah. seven, Cleveland came back, they rallied, they tied it up, and then there was a rain delay. And then the Cubs kind of sort of got their heads back and won the game there in the 10th. That, that tiger I, I blood wore rain, off. Yeah, you're going to see Tuesday, the rain delay is going to be troubles at the polls. And the media is going to, there might be one, who knows? Let's knock on wood and hope there's only one or two incidences at polling places. Um, but the media is going to turn it to where, you know, if there's six people protesting with signs at some polling place and trying to stop traffic, <laughs> they're going to make it look like it's a thousand man march, you know, going on and, and that it's nationwide epidemic of the polling places are all blowing up. I mean, cause stuff is going to go down. That's my prediction. And it, it might not even be a violent going down or, or even a um, actual purposeful reason for things to be happening but there's always screw up at polling places. Regardless, there's always screw up. You know what I mean? A fire alarm gets pulled, electricity goes out. That you know they didn't have a, a backup generator for those little like kiosk polling things. Something's gonna happen. Just in basic terms of there's so many polling places and there's going to be inclement weather in places. It's already got snow in the Northeast. There's tons of snow, so there will be issues of some way and the media they're already in a groundhog day way and i don't mean repeating itself repeating itself but just that kind of like uh we gotta go over here with that you know and uh what was it Pentec- what was that 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 hedgehog thing or whatever that's got to come out in that little town in pennsylvania or New York, whatever. you know remember bill murray had to go up and make a story out of this freaking thing yeah um poxitani phil or whatever the, what's it called well, I know the 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 real one's called Poxitani Phil, something like that. Poxitani Bill, uh, he's like a 
for the groundhog? Hedgehog? A, a groundhog, oh, groundhog hedgehog? Yeah. One, one of those. <laughs> you know, hedgehog day. I think hedgehogs <laughs> are really violent. That would be hilarious. That Because <laughs> it can't be the same ground. I mean, I'm sure they got maybe a similar groundhog, like, you know, every maybe five years. But, you know, they, they, it's not the same groundhog for the last 60 years. And it's not yeah. it's his son or his cousin. But it would be funny that one guy gets a hedgehog and pulls it out and... Uh, it just violently shred the guy's face because I think hedgehogs are like <laughs> sort of like kind of nasty. You know what I mean? That would be hilarious. Yeah. Hey, man, we got a great guest this week, don't we, Creech? We do. Phenomenal. Phenomenal. Um, Huge. Yes, we got a very a very funny actor, but we're actually having him on to talk about a very cool dramatic movie that's actually out in theaters right now and then soon will be on VOD and digital platforms. Um, we're going to have Mr. David Keckner, the infamous Mr. David Keckner, on our podcast for the first time. And we'll have him on more times as we grow older together. Uh, and uh, Mr. Keckner is going to be talking to us about his new film, a drama called Priceless about the sort of um, realities and the underbelly of human trafficking. It's a good story to get out there. Um, he'll be talking about a um, charity that, you know, we'd like to support. And we're going to get that out there. I think it's called childrenofthenight.com. Maybe childrenofthenight.org. Not a vampire site. Um, so go check that out. And uh, so we're going to have him on. He's going to talk about... And he's performing this weekend. Did you know that, Creech? I did. I, I was I was there in the premiere. interview. You were. Yeah, that's right. He'll be at the Funny Bone in St. Louis tonight, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. The Funny Bone in St. Louis. And you can also go to DaveKechner.com to see his other future tour dates. He'll be doing a solo performance night. I don't want to call it stand-up comedy because i think that just labels it in a direction that's stand up as a guy that tells a joke set up a joke you know and has a mic and then he basically accosts the people in the front row makes fun of what they're wearing and stuff like that um i think Ketner's show is, has a little smattering of variety of all of his multifaceted talents um so there, there is a section where he does a photo shoot and he shows off his abs because that's one of that's what Keckner is known for. Uh, but anyway, I digress. We're going to get to him. We're going to let him explain it all. The only thing I would say is the Funny Bone, St. Louis. Why are all those comedy clubs named things like that? You know what I mean? Uh, I don't know. Maybe they're just the going laugh, for the cheap. The, the Laugh Shack. I'll be at the Laugh Shack. We're at the Funny Bone. What, when did that... The, like, it, was there a period where just sort of like everyone had to have these kind of like cringeworthy you know, names? Like a, it's probably like a humor mill yeah. somewhere. Humor mill. We'll be playing at the humor mill. It's like if it didn't belong on a t shirt at Spencer's in the mall, like that, you know what I mean? I felt like all these comedy clubs came out at the same time, like Spencer's was selling like the canned fart and the fake poop. You know what I mean? And, and, uh, you know, and there was the Disco Duck music store and Mr. Tickle, like the, you know, the, the, the head shop and the, the, with the iron-ons, the, the, you know, and uh, Donkey Kong, Pac-Man. They had those kind of softy sort of video games back then. That's that's when, like, the Funny Bone and the Laugh Shack and the Humor Mill and the um, Yuck Yucks, whatever, you know, what's, what's up with that? What what could you call a good comedy club? Acting uh, comedy club? That's already there. What? I don't know. Do you have I, any ideas? What? No, I, I really don't. I mean, I, I've obviously heard of the Laugh Factory, but yeah, Laugh Factory is it's all just kind of like hokey Look, sounding they're always names. Factories. They're always, what, what, they're always like they're, you know what it is. They want to play the blue collar. They want to make sure that they're getting that mask. So they got it's always factory or store. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. It's, it's never like the, um, um, well, they are clubs, too, so you want it. 
a blue collar, but at the same time, you feel very like upper class because it's a club. Who is a club? I belong to a club. Well, it's kind of a union club. It's factory, factory club, laugh factory. Um, so the improv, the improv is a weird one because that that one's in LA. I don't know if they were, they might have other ones, but there's really no improv that goes on at the improv. That's the weirdest one. I, I feel like just throwing a rock at that thing. You know what I mean? <laughs> the improv is you know, comedians doing their sort of like, uh, you know, fully written out stuff. So where where's the improv at? Just trying to like figure out where to park because this parking is never good in that place. <laughs> um, so you got to improvise. Like I got to uh, I got to park over here and put a you know put my hazards on, put a little like a uh, loading sticker on my car. The only way you can park around that place is by improv. But, um, yeah, I mean, what would be a, like a modern 2000, up-to-date 2016, like, comedy club name that would make sense? You know what I mean? That would, wouldn't would feel like you're thing in to, you know, Charlie's Angels sort of, I don't know. You know what I mean? It's kind of like hipster Harlem. Uh-huh. Yeah, because as I'm saying, like all those names, they sound as outdated and soft with the Cooper font lettering like Hooters is, you know, yeah. Hooters just seems outdated, you know. Um, well, well to just... be fair with Hooters being outdated, they are coming out with the male equivalent uh, called Tallywhackers. Yeah. Mm-hmm. We did one on when I produced and wrote for a show called the Ed Bassmaster Show. I never saw the episodes uh, because I don't have cable I think it was on um, CMT yeah and uh, maybe they paired it up with Dude Perfect or something like that Um, but um, we did one called Peckers where and it was like a woodpecker was the logo you know and it was Peckers obviously and 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 the whole joke was we found this like uh, out of business bar and then we put an ad out that we're opening you know, a restaurant, and we're looking for male waiters. And then when they got there, that's when it revealed it's going to be called Peckers. And we had the Hooters esque, you know, short, short, tight, tight shorts and a tank top, and that they had to wear. And there was the Peckers dance, kind of like a Joe's Crab Shack. You know how like a Joe's Crab Shack, they gotta like, they gotta stop and dance every like thirty minutes. With all the yeah. waiters, are you familiar with that? So we had like the Peckers dance, which was all like, sort of like you know. Like the Pee Wee Herman dance? Yeah, it was, no, yeah, it was just sort of like shaking the butt and thrusting with your hips and stuff at the tables, you know, and <laughs> and all the all, all all the food, you know, it was obviously like you got tube steak, you know, and there was all everything was was you know foot long hot dog, everything was just sort of you know phallic on the menu, and they had to like they had to recite the menu. Because in the training, once the guy came out in the outfit, then we had to run him through training, and he had to learn the, the menu, and he had to learn to dance. And obviously, there was no job, but it was pretty funny. But the funniest thing about it was we put the sign up outside. We had this giant Becker sign printed, right? And I actually still have the um, I have one of the T-shirts. I'll take a photo of it when I get home. I'll, I'll send it to you. You can post it. But uh, the neighborhood went up. It was. We shot this in New Orleans, and it was a very conservative neighborhood. We didn't know that. We just went to a place where our location guy found a, a, a bar that was out of business that was willing to rent it to us very cheap because we had no money on TV shows like that. So, But the neighborhood went off, and they called the news, and they organized a protest against Peckers, and this is real. <laughs> that was real. It got on the news. You could Google that. If you Google Peckers and uh, something parish in New Orleans, uh, Louisiana, because it wasn't in New Orleans proper. It was like in a maybe Jefferson Parish. I don't know, but uh, it was hilarious, man, that they, they picked up and ran stories on it, and people were organizing, you know, like, honk if you don't want Peckers. You know, like, stop Peckers. We don't want Peckers here. No Peckers here. This is a family neighborhood. <laughs> sort of like, that was great. Well, then. So speaking of tally whackers, tally whackers, that sounds like it would be like an Australian food, Mike. That, that seems like, tally whackers, it sounds like an Australian word. 
It kind of does, like, yeah. Like, yeah, no, I, 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 I can I feel like, agree with that. Yeah. That kind of feels like, you know, the guys from Down Under, whatever, Thunder from Down Under, waiters, you know what I'm saying? It's just going to be dudes wearing, like, these leather crocodile Dundee gun, <laughs> crocodile Dundee, like, you know, like some sort of, like, outdoory vest but no shirt and they've got like cool like, necklaces with the alligators on them tallywhackers and they're wearing tight tight designer jeans they all have like long professional wrestler hair you know they just look like chippendales and they're oiled up I who's gonna it. go to tallywhackers <laughs> well would you go and eat a tallywhackers i would have no problem if food's good if their food, yeah, if, they, if their food's good then hilarious. i can't i wouldn't i wouldn't care it's not like they're they're yeah. waving it around in my face you know, I'm sure they, yeah. they, they've got a, they don't want to get sued, so they wouldn't be doing stuff like that. So, yeah, if the food's great, I wouldn't, I wouldn't have no problem eating there. Exactly. I, I would, I would go there and fuck with the waiters, go there with my wife and fuck with the waiter that, because we like the food so much, that's why we're there, right? But I'm, but I'm like playing like that hardcore misogynistic husband. Who's like, you know, I don't quite backhand him, but just like, don't even look at him. Don't even look at him. And like, you looking at my wife? Are you looking at my wife? Just give us our food. He came here for the food. You know what I mean? <laughs> just making him feel so like awkward. And he's coming up with his pecs and he's oiled up. And he's like, welcome to Cali Rackers, mate. You know, and I'm like, don't even, hey, hey, look your eyes here, buddy. And I tell my wife, I'm like, hey, 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 hey. You look down at the menu. You know, we come here to, to look at them, you know. You know, buns ain't no bakery, you know what I'm saying? So we're not here to look at that, all right? We're here to eat. We're here for the jalapeno poppers, and that's it, all right? You wanted the jalapeno poppers? I got you the jalapeno poppers. Not, don't even look at that guy. And then just him being like, uh, uh, I think he's, like, abusing his wife, you know? <laughs> that would be funny, right? Make him... It, it would. It would that. be. It would be great for like a sketch show or something like that, where you're you know, ah, hidden see, camera, you hidden would, camera type that's thing. Well, I do a lot. And that's my problem. Is I can never get out of that hidden camera stuff I did for so long. I'm just kind of. But I did the hidden camera stuff because I was already doing the sort of theater of the anarchy my whole life. You know, you came out and ate, ate with me at that one pizza place. Most people only come out to a restaurant and eat with Dave Sheridan one time because they realize very quickly that our food gets spit in. Because I just can't hold, I just can't stop, man. I, I, I have the fuck with people button always on, especially at restaurants. You know what I'm saying? Or valet parkers or checkout ladies at the supermarket or the, definitely the bagger kid. You know what I mean? That's just, you know. He might as well have his name on there and also victim 76778 Dave Sheridan fucking with bag boys. Bag person. Be politically correct. Yeah. I just can't help it, man. I fuck with people. I think it's probably um, something to do with me being bullied as a kid and, and just me not. I'm, like, I'm just insecure, I guess, you know? Look at that. We're having a breakthrough. We're having a breakthrough moment. Yeah. We're having a breakthrough moment. Freaking therapy. Right, right before, uh, right before our, our Keckner interview. Yeah. So David Keckner. So we're going to talk to David Keckner about his new film, Priceless. And the reason I saw the trailer, I was, you know, I wanted to wait for our show to get a little bit, uh, more established. I told you, I was like, yeah, I want to be on for a year. Let's get the format going. Let's really get our feet up. And then I'm going to go to some of my friends and, and, um, you know, sort of hit bigger swings, so to speak, you know? But when I saw the trailer and I don't remember how I even saw the trailer, it just came upon a trailer. It might've been at the top of, you know, a Google search or something, you know, how they have banners and stuff. But um, it's a drama. And when I saw Keckner and his character, I was like, wow, this is the kind of shit that I want to see David Keckner do. And that's why I wanted to talk with him. And that's why I wanted to promote this film. And that's why I wanted to get eyeballs on it. 
to really get eyeballs on Kessner doing the drama, man, because um, I know that he's just going to be a staple in that kind of world when he when he just starts rolling in, you know. Um, he'll be Dave Kessner will be in a Tarantino movie within the next five years, and Dave Kessner will be in a Martin Scorsese movie in the next five years. Mark my words. Will he be accepting an Academy Award? I don't know. Maybe. Maybe. Don't don't go full retard, though. You know? Never go full retard. No. No. Unless you are technically retarded, like the kid that paid Corky or on that one show, Life Goes On or whatever. You know, then it's probably okay. You, you probably still win an award, but, you know, that's what they say. It's hard to go back after that one. Well, let's get to Dave Kekner, man. Dave Sheridan. Uh, well, I guess we missed him, Creech. We tried. Oh, come <laughs> on now. <laughs> right. Mr. Kekner, how are you? How are you? I'm Nathan. doing well. Are you, what are you doing? You're about to get on a flight soon? You're going to St. Louis? Uh, that's, that's tomorrow. Today I've got... Uh, this and then some writing to do and then I'm doing Tom Arnold's podcast and then my son's basketball meeting and then stand up and then at some point in the, in the middle there I'll have to pack and then I take off tomorrow morning. Oh, so you're doing stand up in Los Angeles? Yeah, yeah. You know, you got to get some sets in before you go do your other. <clears throat> I got, I got, yeah. I got five, five full shows this weekend, so you got to get back and. Get back into the batting cages, as it were. Yeah. Okay, so you fly tomorrow for a show on Thursday or a show on Friday? Two shows Friday, two on shows Thursday, Saturday, on... show Sunday? No, no, one, one Thursday, two Friday, two Saturday. Anyway, right. Creech has a show to do, and we should probably do it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, 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 you don't want to get in your way here. Well, real yeah. quick, Dave, real quick, let, let's just jump back real quick to the St. Louis dates. That's this weekend. I don't know if we're going to get this podcast up before this weekend. Um, yeah, I'll have, it up, I'll have it up by Friday. By Friday? All right. So where, yeah. where, where can people in St. Louis, in the St. Louis area, catch you do your stand-up this weekend? Uh, at the St. Louis Funny Bone in the Westport Plaza. Got it. And then um, and in terms of future Dave Keckner. and I hate to call it stand-up, do you really define what you do as stand-up? You perform at what's known as stand-up clubs, but you're, I'm, I'm sure that you're a, just a one-man performance machine. There's probably a lot of variations to your show and stuff like that. Um, well, what can like people expect to, when you get up on stage? Yeah, that's a great way of putting it. I, you know, my show's not, um, and I don't mean to denigrate anybody else, cookie cutter. Like, so I don't try to emulate necessarily anybody else's style. I'll see Sometimes you'll see a bunch of stand-up in a row that's kind of the same. There's a, there's a real rhythm to some stand-up, and uh, there's some real great ones, I think, that break the mold, and they just have such a strong point of view that you're, they're a wonder, like Bill Burr. You're just like, my God, this guy is phenomenal. Um, uh, but anyway, I, I, you know, my style is a little bit different than I would say your, your, your standard, what you think of as standard stand-up, in that... I do have characters within my hour-long show, but I also have just, you know, pieces that are just jokes, just, you know, a string of jokes. I also have uh, stories that just have jokes in them. So uh, can you tighten things up more? Of course, always. You know, I've only been doing it six years, which, you know, in, in three rings is maybe one. Uh, as you know, Dave, you and I started doing sketch uh, at the same time in Chicago back in the uh, mid-'80s. And uh, it's a different world than stand-up. Yeah. So my stuff tends to be relationship-based within my each chunk, if you will. And I'd say be the major difference or a point of attack for me. Right. You know, the one thing for me, and I'm actually, uh, I'm thinking of, I haven't done stand-up. I, when I was 18, I got up a couple times, a couple big names took me out. Just, you know, hey, I'll come open up. I'll give you five minutes in front of me. And you, that's not the way you test it because I, for me, it, it was such a tiny litmus test, and I was so young, and I didn't have enough of a viewpoint 
or my own voice at all anyway, you know, and so I, but I became, and that's honestly what pushed me in towards, I mean, my story short was that Adam Sandler took me out and Chris Rock took me out. Those two guys gave me time in front of their sets in New York when I was 18 years old. And uh, Farley, they were, you know, it was all, they were all in the SNL at the time. They came back, they talked about how I bombed. And he said, well, what are you doing? I said, well, I get up there and I do these characters and I do these commercial parodies. And, uh, and he said, you know, you, you need to go to Second City. You need to, what you're doing would be better fitted for a sketch comedy thing, Second City. And, and, and then that was sort of the context. You know, he called Joyce and got me set up to, to you know, come to Chicago. Oh, Farley did or, or yeah, Farley. Farley. Farley called Joyce uh, Sloan, and that's and then uh, you're my you're my new kid. And she would say, uh, I mean, like you're cute. Come sit with me. Oh my gosh! I'll never pass Dan Haggerty though. You know, you get in that room and she's like Bill Murray, yeah, uh, you know, like he's Chris Farley, but Dan Haggerty, he's he's my favorite ever. Yeah, <laughs> I, it's, I still, it's uh, Haggerty lands a joke. Uh, almost like nobody else. He's got such a, uh, a perfect, he's got such perfect timing, and uh, it's like he lands that plane on the aircraft carrier every time. Right. It, it, he's, he's got an impeccable, <laughs> remarkable personal timing. Yeah, it's great. But my thing now is, and, and, and as you started, because you went through, you've had, before you, like you said, you started to do solo performance, let's, you know, let's, we'll call it, we'll, for short, we'll call it stand-up. You started doing that, um, and was that a business decision on your part because you clearly had a phenomenal television career, film career, on the acting side, you know, lots of uh, memorable characters and stuff, but was it about... What made you say, okay, six years ago, let me start doing this now at this age of, I'm going to guess you were, um, hold on, I'm going to say 46. How old were you? I think I was, four, I was 48 then. 48. Oh, well, here's, okay. here's, what, here's what it was. There was a down, so, you know, when the, the economy took a, a, a dump in 08, it usually mm. takes a couple of years for it to catch up in Hollywood. And then I kind of noticed it catching up in Hollywood with some jobs that I normally got didn't come right away. And uh, some other people were taking those jobs that, I, that weren't even character actors. And I was like, huh, things are changing. So I called my agent, and I just kind of wanted a backup plan in case. And I said, could you get me on the road? And she called me the next day with 11 gigs uh, headlining all over the country. And I was like, oh, wow, I better put an act together. I mean, they were three months out. I mean, it wasn't like she booked me the next week. But that's typical. Right. You, know, you're not gonna, you know, unless a, a comic falls out and they need someone to fill in, it's the case is usually three months before you're going to do the next, you know, if you just start, let's say like that. So I you know, worked in town in LA and you can, there's all kinds of rooms and clubs. You can get up and try material uh, 15 minutes at a time. So I just worked and did that for three months, put together an hour long show and then, uh, then went out. And, and when I did start, it was more like a one man show. I think I had five, five costume changes in the show in the very beginning. And then I quickly right. realized, okay, I've got to make this, you know, I've got to trowel this thing out. I've got to make it work a little, you know, as seamless as possible. That's one, that's one of the arts, you know, and there is an art form to stand up. And you really do have to work at it and, you know, figure out what that running order and how you put these pieces together, what works and what doesn't. You know, there might be a joke or two that you love in the show that just has to go away or just doesn't fit in the premise that you're trying to put together or you, you throw a couple premises together and it takes you a while to realize that, you know, you got to pick one over the other. So, yeah, it's it's a great process. But I would like to say that I think I've always, you know, at least at the bottom line, you, you know, I can entertain for an hour. Whether you know I'm the best stand up is is a different thing. Uh, I know I can I can put on a great show for an hour. Yeah, yeah. I mean, look, that's never stopped Jeff Garland, right? He gets up there and talks for an hour and a half, and you know. <laughs> yeah, Jeff. Jeff, you know, wildly entertaining. He is. He is. But I mean, he's. I've. I've. I've uh, been on stage with him many, many times, and but, and I. That's. This is what I love the most about Jeff is this. He's like, I'm gonna. You know, I, what I have to say is what I have to say, and I'm gonna be entertaining uh -huh. saying it. But at the same time, man, just keep talking. <laughs> it's sort of like, 
you know, you you control the mic, you control yeah. the stage. They paid for you to be there, and with your comedy, you know, first of all, you didn't stop performing on stage. You had the naked trucker right. uh, as a you know a, a perennial mm-hmm. performance thing in L.A. for years. So it it wasn't yeah. like you're like, and I haven't been up. You know, you were you were always out, keeping fresh in sort of a live performance spectrum, um, which is hard to do uh, when somebody like yourself is actually already working, you know, on top of that. So um, yeah. I'm glad I've, yeah, I've always done live. I've always done live. Uh, and so I'm, I'm so happy I did. I think, and, and you, you probably agree, it informs every part of your work. To do live gives you, uh, you know, it's a different muscle, but it also inform every other medium that you work in. Right, because you take that confidence going, okay, look, I, I mean, it might be a completely different medium, but we're going to talk about your, your movie Priceless in a minute, but, uh, um, you know, whether it's dramatic or comedic or whatever, at the same time, the biggest muscle is understanding, uh, you know, timing and connecting with an audience through your body and through whether that's you saying a joke or your physicality, and that's the great thing about comedy and what you're doing right now in St. Louis is, when you started working your own solo show out, you have an immediate, I wouldn't, I would call it gratification, but you also know it's like the chicken that has to hit that light bulb to get that piece of corn, you know, or he has to hit the button yep. and the light bulb goes off and gets a piece of corn. As a, as a stand-up comic or anybody performing live in a comedy venue, you know you did something right because they laugh. So therefore, you know yep. that worked, that didn't work. Why didn't that work? Yep. You know? Yeah, but my it, question it, it, in, Informs you you're still on the right path. Right. Here's my question to you in terms of if there's other comedians out there listening and they're looking to, to develop their act, they're looking to develop their voice, and they're working through their pages up on stage. Do you feel that it's probably more important to capitalize on what's working and, and when something, oh, that joke hit, okay, what hit about that joke? Now let me double down on that. Let me triple down and get two laughs and then a big laugh and a clap and applause. Or do sometimes you believe in a joke and go, man, I know that's funny. It didn't hit. Okay, it's off color. Okay, it's not the temperature of what people want today or it's just not funny or, I'm not, or I tweak the way I say it. Like, do you, do you focus on fixing some stuff that might not be getting laughs or do you say, quickly toss those aside, and let me double up on the stuff that I'm getting response on. Uh, I'd say both are true, but what I typically do or, or, or the, the, is the path that's working the best. Uh, some premises take a lot longer to crack, and they might work for a couple minutes, but then you've got to figure out the end that you don't have the second half, and it might be a while before you come to it. I, I have a premise where, where Mary is trying to collect life insurance on Jesus. Mm-hmm. And uh, I've worked it out on stage several times, and half of it's good. But the other half of it, Mary kind of gets tough with the insurance adjuster because the insurance adjuster's upset going, well, I know I was there when the guy went through that really horrible day, awful day. Uh, and by the way, I was yelling for Jesus, not Barabbas. But um, we've got a lot of people coming forward saying, um, do you know Thomas? Yeah. He, now, he, uh, he's a skeptic, and he said he saw him. And I thought, so look, I've got people I've got to answer. Anyway, you get it. But it's, it's, that's a tougher premise, right? Because right. it's, re- it's really a sketch that I'm trying to work out, and I don't have an end for it. So I just keep, right. you know. And then so I dropped that. That would be an example of something I, that made me laugh. But then I, I like that idea if, if you try to work that into an encapsulation of from the crucifixion, and it's just it's in that little three-day period that she's trying to get the insurance. And then, you know, she either gets it approved or – and then, obviously, he comes back, so therefore it's like, oh, crap, you know, all that stuff I went through. <laughs> but, well, you could, you could have it on two, two occasions where she sits down right away and the insurance adjuster goes, I'm so sorry, just sign this paperwork right. and the, check, or the, the money will be here on, on, uh, on, yes. uh, on Monday. So after this Sunday, which is 
which, yeah, and so you kind of reinforce the idea of Easter Sunday. After Sunday, the money will be here on Monday. And she comes in Monday, and he's like, okay, uh, there's a lot of talk in town. That, that might help the premise. That she yeah. The yeah, she gets a pay back to get, yeah. I and can't then, cut you uh, the check yeah. on Sunday. Banks aren't open on Sunday. It's Passover. Right. Uh, you know, <laughs> it's sort of like. Exactly. And then, uh, exactly. And then she comes Monday. She's like, I just like to go ahead and get that. You know, we're devastated. He's like, yeah. Listen, I got a call from the main office, and that might be yeah. easier. His yeah, name is Job. E- his name is Job Easter, or it's like yeah. Easter Insurance, or something. And then that's why it's called Easter Sunday. <laughs> he was he was, yeah. Uh, but there's also that he, you know, he also we covered Lazarus. You know Lazarus, and um, I paid that claim yeah. right away. And if you remember, I mean Lazarus, he's doing well. He opened a flower shop. Yeah, and, I got uh, bid on that one. I got bid on your, that, your, right? <laughs> your, your son kind of had a hand in that, too. So, listen, I, I just got a way to beat. Yeah, but oh, that's that funny. He says, I got a lot of red flags. There's a lot of red flags here. You know, we're caught up in that other insurance scam. Your son was caught up in that other insurance scam. And, again, <laughs> you're a great family. I mean, Joseph did our cabinet. Uh, and, gosh, those are, those are great. Yeah. If Joseph was a carpenter. Yeah. yeah. I think we knew that. Chris, did you know so, that? Yeah. Oh, it, just, it just wasn't. Um, but no, no, it was and, funny. I was laughing. Okay. I, anyway, that's the type of a thing that I've sometimes worked on, and, and it, that's out of laziness where you just work it out on stage, and you don't, if you don't go back and write it and write it and write it, then, you know, you don't, you don't finish it. But sometimes it's just this, having a conversation with someone else who has a different take on it makes all the difference in the world. It's just going, you didn't sew on one sleeve. I don't know why the, uh, right. there's a clothing metaphor to this, but. <laughs> yeah, especially since Jesus had his clothes pretty much ripped off. Yeah, I guess maybe that's what the inspiration <laughs> was. I, I always wanted to open a Body of Christ gym because that guy was. Oh rich, my God! You know what I mean? <laughs> he had that Body of Christ buddy. You know the uh, he was ripped. Christian dream. and you know you got your stations. You know how the Catholic Church has the stations, but you yeah, have your workout the twelve stations. Station. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> body of Christ, and he's funny. like the trainer, kind of like that that one of those trainers they have on TV. You know, always just like oh my God. yelling at people Every... and pushing people. Oh, and every single station is about him. You using a if you talk about CrossFit. Ouch, that's right. right. Yeah, CrossFit. He's got the. They're on the treadmill. He's running next to him on like a like a water thing or something like that. Come on. Well, you know how people carry tires and flip tires. Right. You've got to carry yeah, carry like, this cross across the gym, and then you've got it. Then you you do pull ups on it. Right. And chin ups on it. Right. All that. Yeah. Oh my and god. You got to move the boulder. Straight. Whoever gets the, yeah. whoever oh, gets the boulder nice. from the that's your final. Yeah, you get you get to move yeah. the boulder and you you get like a one year membership or something like that. Eternal, you get a, a ter, a eternity membership. You know what I mean? Nice. <laughs> that, that that sketch all falls in place. You're not going to piss anybody off with it. That's for sure. I'll tell you. Uh, I don't know. You know, I don't live in L.A. You know, I don't live in Los Angeles, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You live in North Carolina. I'm in Charlotte. The thing about these CrossFits in the Charlotte area is they're always set up in a strip mall, and they kind of, they're in these small little storefronts where they just basically taken over the parking lots, you know. And so oh. you see those people with the tires or they're running with the weights or whatever it is, and but they're in the parking lot. You're trying to park your car, and it's just like I got a guy flipping a giant. Tire oh. Next to uh, do, uh, have you, do you have anything like that in L.A., or is it just all being, like, uh, taken care of in-house still, like that crazy CrossFit stuff? Uh, it's, 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 not, it's not true. Uh, there's a couple places that I see them uh, outside. Uh, they have to run, but they're, they're not too intrusive in terms of bringing their gear out into the street. Um, there's a couple places where you'll see people having to run with stuff out of their right. little exercise shop. But it's usually yeah. a short distance, and the only annoyance there is if you're pulling into a parking lot for another business, uh, you have to wait on their traffic as opposed to them actually taking up space. Yeah, I went into the, the sub shop. is right next door. It's actually a sub call, shop called Witch Witch. I don't know if you guys have those out there. Uh, yeah, yeah, I've seen those. And, uh, and, and against that wall, and this is a strip mall. These are very thin walls. They've got the pull-up bars where these people are like, hitting them with their legs, and it's like, bong, bong, bong. <laughs> 
the poor wow. worker. He's just trying to make a sandwich and everything's shaking off the shelf. And I go, what's going on? And he's like, yeah, they just, I, we've talked to them several times, you know. We keep telling him the key has to keep, it's just like, I wanted to run over there, but I was like, you know, it's none of my business, I guess, you know. Yeah. This is, that's the, this is where I get tempted to get in the middle of stuff where, where I, of course, you know, sometimes it gets me into trouble because uh, I get, chat. Get on much. the side, side of right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But uh, on the, um, oh, man, I, I drew a blank there. Oh, I do have one Jesus joke that, because, uh, you know, you said Joseph was a carpenter, but Jesus was also a carpenter, too. He was an apprentice Correct. to his father and his brother, with his brother James. Uh, so that was my joke is what did Jesus say when the Romans were nailing him to the cross? And he said, uh, these nails won't hold. That was my joke. Because <laughs> he's a carpenter. He knew. Yeah. He knew they weren't yeah. the right nails. It was Wrong <laughs> nails or uh, you drove. You, really? That's the angle? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Guys, if I could just help you out. Yeah, you want to drive at, a, at, a, at, a, at about a 45 degree angle, not straight yeah. in. There you go. Oh, oh, yeah. oh, 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 there you go. That's good. That'll hold. Ah. Yeah. <laughs> or he's going well, they to go didn't use that. Go ahead. No, I'm saying they didn't use finishing, finishing nails. That's for sure. Right. Because he wasn't. He's like, hey, let me stop you real done. quick. Uh, yes. That's good. <laughs> um, but, yeah, now going right into the Christ, uh, uh, I did a, a, a movie that was, was religious-based, and uh, or a message movie called Priceless, and it is out in theaters now. And it will, I'm sure, be either video on demand or available uh, on DVD soon. Uh, it's called Priceless, and it was a message film. It's, it's about human trafficking. And so uh, a buddy of mine was producing it, and... I read the script. Uh, you know, I've got three daughters, and I thought, you know, this is such a it's a, such a true horror. What's going on with with human trafficking in every major city in the country? People don't realize that it's everywhere. There's a girl being held against her will who's being prostituted, and didn't want to join that life. People, I think, tend to think that uh, a woman's making a choice to go into that type of work, or more often than not, the the case is is otherwise. Like they don't want to be there. And so um, I did the film, and since then I've, I've uh, hooked up with an organization called Children of the Night, and they have a facility here in Van Nuys, actually, here in Los Angeles, where they take girls from the ages of 11 to 17, and they're out there. Girls that are being trafficked from the ages of 11 to 17, and they, they take them out of their life, and they give them a living space, and they give them education and resources and job training, and help them get their lives back. But I mean, when I did a little bit of research about trafficking, just your 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 soul will be ripped apart. So I did the movie. It's not my typical fare in terms of you know it's a drama a, and b it's got you know it's got some it's got I had to carry some message. Some uh, my character was the guy that you know kept reminding him that there's a higher power at work. But anyway, that was uh, an interesting thing, and if uh, people have a listen, they can probably still find Priceless, maybe in, in the, one of their local cineplexes, or uh, it'll be available to you either online or through DVD. But anyway, that was well, a nice look, look, from, yeah. We first no, consulted I'm, anybody that might be interested. In <laughs> <laughs> let's let bash on the Christians. I'm a Christian, so I can do that. I think I don't know. I mean, but, I, but we weren't uh, necessarily bashing. On yeah, them. we were just. Yeah. Hey, man, I, I truly believe, and I have to because this is the business I'm in, is making people laugh. And sometimes you make people laugh with off-color jokes. But I, clearly, we know they always say laughter is the best medicine. But we, Jesus himself, partied. They, they, they had a good time. Even on the Sabbath, they, they celebrated when they weren't supposed to be. And the, the, the bottom line is that, you know, like he says, is, the God of Abraham is a living God, and, and part of life is crying and pain, but the other, you know, there's other sides of laughter, and we, we certainly are a tool, I think, uh, in, a, in a sense, to help people laugh. That's, that's, I wouldn't say it's our burden, but, uh, you know, I had to do a lot of, I'm not a dentist, let's put it that way. I could never yeah. be a dentist, and I can't work in a cubicle, so I must, this must be something that I'm good at. I have a, uh, you know, I have some natural talent to it, but at the same time, yep. me, uh, if this is what I'm here for, let me go and do this. So I think that laughter 
and whether it's making some puns and some jokes of, like, say, the body of Christ and stuff like that, I, I believe that uh, God must have a good sense of humor. Look at the duckbill platypus. Look at this political race, and we're not going to get political at all. But the fact of the matter is this shit show, talk about a shit show, this shit show is, is God's version of the Kardashians reality TV for himself. You know, I mean, he just has, he forgot he TV'd it, and uh, <laughs> he hasn't shut it off yet. Oh, yeah. man. <laughs> But, but yeah, uh, I agree with you. I think, I think God's got a great sense of humor. Yeah, come on, parachute pants. What about those pants that MC Hammer wore? <laughs> come on, they, 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 things like that can't exist, you know, if God doesn't isn't cracking himself up a little bit. If so, he doesn't say, but, watch, "Watch this." Now, now the, the the charity is called Children of the Night. Yes, and I'm I'm sure that people can Google that. Yep. Probably just you go right the to their, their – it'll Google it. It'll take you to their Facebook page or their, their website, and you can donate with one click. Yeah. And the, and the thing is, in this particular movie, this deals with trafficking of um, – I, I think I saw – I only saw the trailer. And, uh, um, but I think it's uh, immigrants, right, like uh, South American immigrants, maybe yes. women that are getting trafficked. Yeah. But that's not the case yes, from, in, in the world. The world is in America that there are American citizens, young girls being trafficked. You know, how they get to that point is that's, a, you know, a, a very complex situation of whether that situation is at home, being run away, actually being kidnapped, being introduced to drugs at an early age and falling into the wrong crowds. I, I can't say how, you know, people get into getting trafficked. But the situation is, if you really, you know, and it's not a talked about thing. Your cousins might know somebody, your aunt, you know, these are the things that are seldom talked about at the dinner table. Uh, but, but we're all probably very connected to this human trafficking. So don't think it's a, a situation that doesn't affect you um, because it probably is, you know, six degrees of Kevin Bacon worth probably three degrees of sex trafficking. Um, so yeah. just the fact very, that I know very, you now, Dave Keckner. So, yeah, there you go. Very, yeah. very well put. But that, and, and when I saw the trailer, that's why I wanted to reach out, because I've been holding a special place to have you on our podcast. I wanted to wait until we built a huge audience and, and pull my I'm friends with Dave Keckner card. Uh, but, but when I saw this film, I immediately identified it as something different that was outside of the box of, oh, this is an Anchorman 3. You know, I don't need to have you on my podcast to promote Anchorman 3 because you'll be on ESPN five times a week when that comes out, you know, or it yeah. already came yeah. out, I don't know. But this is a now, small... That's, all, that's the only thing people will hear from this podcast is, there's an Anchorman 3? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that'll be all over the news sites tomorrow. Yeah. Yeah. Ke- Kettner announces Anchorman 3. <laughs> well, I hope I didn't screw you up, man. <laughs> You, it just, uh, it's a total Peter Sellers uh, shit rolling upstream situation there, right? Anchorman 3 does happen because of this. This is great. But you're not in it because you, you, you spilled the beans too early. <laughs> right. Uh, no, McKay actually was, was – because uh, anytime any of us that were in the movie go out and promote another movie, they always ask about Anchorman 3. I'm not kidding. And McKay was getting asked about it so much during the – uh, uh, promotion of the big short that he finally right. said, yes, there's going to be a third one, but it's going to be in 10 years. Right. Because <laughs> that's how long it took to make the second one. Yeah. Yeah. So exactly. Let, your, why let not them hear all, that the whole story. Yeah. But on this, um, on this price list, which by the way, I think it, you know, definitely check your, the, the, the listeners out there, ch- check your, um, your VOD on your, on your, do a search on your cable and do a search on, uh, uh, you know, your iTunes and stuff like that. Cause a, a film like this tends to be on the VOD relatively quick, uh, almost right. day in, day out. Um, cause how many theaters was it released in Dave? Do you know? Just 300. Okay. 300. Got it. And, um, but, but, but you don't do too many dramatic roles. And that's when I saw that I was like, okay, this looks like a really cool film. Your role looks 
really cool. What, one of the things I wanted to ask you was in preparation for a film like this, and you've done, you have done dramatic stuff, but this one seems like, oh, this is pretty meaty, and you've got a pretty good size role in it. Um, I wouldn't say was there any sort of like a knocky knees, you know, oh, hey, I'm getting into something. You should challenge yourself to do something that's always outside of your box. That's how you grow as any human. But um, was there any, uh, I wouldn't say trepidation, but like just what, was there a difference in how you prepared for a role in a film like this versus, oh, showing up to Anchorman 3 like next week when you start shooting Anchorman 3? Uh, you probably just put on the, base, <laughs> the, the cowboy hat. And, <laughs> um, yes, to answer your question, yes, you do pre- you do prepare it differently because you have to have an honest interpretation uh, or an on- a more a, 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 a different type of honest performance. I'll put it that way because I don't want to I don't want to say that a comic performance performance isn't honest, but a dramatic performance has a different uh, texture of honesty. I would say that you're striving for. Because you don't want to just be doing line readings. That, that's the thing. Because, right. You know, then it's just it does, you want the you want the performance to have a, a, a more resonant tone. I actually got a good review of the in Variety or the Hollywood Reporter. I forget which one. One of them said uh, gave me a good notice, so that was nice. Yeah. It goes beyond just not shaving for a couple of days, you're saying, right? Uh, uh, you know what? Dramatic role, I just got to add a little stuff on my face. Don't think I... Perfect. That's Hold perfect. On. No, you, you know what? They wanted little... me to look. They want. They wanted me to look a little older, and uh, gray is coming in my beard quite prominently now, so that we felt that that helped. Oh my God. That 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 must sink in a little bit as an actor when you're saying uh, we want you to look a little bit older when technically you already look in the mirror every day going I I don't know if you've seen it but I'm pretty much looking older of lately <laughs> like, I mean I'm oh, not shutting sure. down but you know no we we're all no, we're yeah, not I mean, the, chickens the, anymore so for them to say look a little older it's like well what do you want John Boyd at this point like uh, a <laughs> yeah they probably would have loved that had they been able to get it. Uh, but, you know, to me, it's just another phase of your career, which I'm grateful for. Yeah. If I, if I, if I played just dads and grandpas for the next 30 years, I'd be pretty happy. Well, you're an average-looking guy. And don't, don't get that. Don't, don't, I hope you're not getting offended. But the thing is, I mean, you, you, you yourself called you a character actor. The thing about oh, yeah. the no. old, old-school character actors is they have much longer longevity in films you know, like a Ned Beatty and stuff, because they are sort of timeless in their look, and and as they and if they do age or put on a little weight or get a little more bags under their eyes or whatever, like Seymour Gisela, whatever that guy's name is, it's sort of like uh, that's just a patina that just keeps adding to the castability. You know. So. Well, I agree. I agree. No, I don't take offense to that, and I I know exactly who I am, and uh, yeah, you use what you have to your advantage. That's what we all do. That's part of the part of the. Your toolbox. Yeah. But uh, like who's, the, hey, to who's the guy that played the wizard quick. really quick? Go ahead. The wizard Sorry. on what? Wizard of Oz? Uh, yeah, no, not the wizard. <laughs> the, the main, like, I don't know if it was Geldof or whatever, from the Lords of the Ring, the, the Ian McKellen. Yes. That guy is looked like that. You know, I just found out he's only 63 years old, you know, and I'm like, geez, like, He's looked like he's like 85 since like 1985, you know? <laughs> Look at a pagoda, man. Yeah. He's the dude you yeah, thought died and fish. then died and then died. It's like, is fish? I can't believe fish is still alive. And it's like, well, he died looking exactly the same way he looked in Barney Miller. <laughs> yes. Uh, yeah. Uh, he's 77, actually, born in 1939, Ian McKellen. Yeah. I was I was playing it down lower for a joke, but I think I need some. <laughs> no, I think he's forty-eight. I think he, no, he lies about his age to get those roles. Right, dude. he's only People forty-eight. Roll. You're absolutely right. Hey, listen, I'm gonna have to go, but I do want to mention also I'm gonna do a series for CBS called Superior Donuts, which is gonna be uh, debuting yes. most likely in January uh, with Judd Hirsch and uh, Jermaine Fowler and Katie Seagal. Uh, very excited about that. 
so I hope to be in everyone's living room for a very long time. You're shooting that now? We start end of November. We've already end shot November, the pilot in, yeah. Uh, I ABC think it's going to date here in, in January. Pardon what, me? What channel? What channel again? BBS. BBS. Well, great. Yeah, congratulations on that. And again, the, the film is priceless. The charity is called Children of the Night. Look for Anchorman 3 out in May. <laughs> and uh, double check your local stand-up places for Dave Keckner. Dave, is there a website for Dave Keckner where people can, can, can maybe go and see the, where your future dates would be on doing performing live? Yes, there's davidkechner.com. You can follow me at Twitter, at David Keckner, which K-O-E-C-H-N-E-R, also on Instagram. So uh, all fine places to keep uh, – and I'll, you, can, you can like my Facebook page. Oh, hey, by the uh, way, how's can... John Montgomery on the uh, – is he, is he involved in that uh, Spirit yes. Donuts? Yeah, what a, what a wonderful guy. What a sweetheart of a man, John. He, 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 only, he's, uh, he was one of the first guys I met in Chicago getting my first little PA, guy, PA gig. So, Isn't that right? Yeah. He's, I'll tell him you said hi. He is a sweetheart. Yeah, tell him I said hi. I was going to email him and, and tell him congrats on that. And uh, We have a funny story because he sent me down. We're shooting at a hotel, and he sent me down. We, 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 we were shooting this hotel door right with the numbers on it. This is back when the hotels actually had the numbers right on the little door. And uh, he, he sent me to go get another number off another door because we didn't want to change locations, but we wanted to make it look like it was another door, right? And so he sent me down the hall with a screwdriver. And I started taking the door number off the screwdriver, and this voice behind the thing was like, hey, who are you? And I was like, huh? So what are you doing? I go, um, I'm shooting a film. I just borrowing your number for a minute, right? I didn't ask the hotel or anything. Well, on the other end, it turned out it was Woody Harrelson like hiding out in a hotel room, like, you know, partying up for like a weekend. I don't know what he was doing, but it just turned into, I was just a PA and I turned the whole thing into a big shit storm because Woody just called down and was like, what the fuck? You're filming on my, on, on my, you know, on my floor. You know, this is, no, you got to shut that down because it was just a short film. <laughs> wow. Later. All right. Great. Pleasure. Okay. Great. Peace. Bye. Bye. All right. There you go. That, my friend, is what we call the Dave and Preach Show, episode 39. That was an epic one because we had an epic guest, David Keckner. I think that was a great interview, dude. I think that was um, one of our best. Yes. One of our best guests. He's going to go down as one of our best guests that, that isn't on The Walking Dead. Right. Or hasn't been on The Walking Dead. Obviously, I don't think, you know, we're kind of a Walking Dead centric podcast so therefore you know michael cudlet or players like that and uh jordan's gonna be on next, you know next week they're always gonna sort of work their way to the top because of the topic um as far as i know at this point keckner is not on the walking dead this season or has not been on the walking dead unless he's been you know dead like a zombie and we just don't know it one last thing. I just want to say one last thing. We're going to leave it on this. Um, but correct me if I'm wrong. In your, if you need to go edit and re-record it, preach. The website for the charity that is a very good cause. Um, and if you can please go and check it out. It does affect everyone. I think it's called Children of the Night. It is, yes. Dot com. But it could be dot org. I didn't get any clarification on that. Night. If you, you know, I didn't, I didn't he, he did say if you Google Children of the Night, it should pop right up. Mm -hmm. Is there like a rock song, Children of the Night? I have no clue. It there, sounds it sounds like some, like some kind of kids kids Batman themed band. Children of the Night sounds like a like a I'm Hall and Oates song, but like a Billy Joel song or something like that. You know, Children of the Night, or like a Motley Crue song, Children of the Night. The awesome. Children of the Corn, Children of the Corn. Don't go to childrenofthecorn.com. You would be donating to satanic, um, demonic kids that live in cornfields somewhere in Nebraska. That's not the organization we're trying to support. 
we're trying to have people donate to Children of the Night. All right? Exactly. All right, you go do your thing, man. Have a great day. You too, and we will talk to everybody next week. Thank you, people, for listening of the Earth. Shut up and sit down. Thank you for listening to the Dave and Creed Show. The views and opinions expressed in this podcast are solely those of Dave and CJ. These views and opinions do not necessarily represent those of Creed Creative Productions or any of its affiliates.